Welcome back everybody to the Law of Trusts. In this lesson we're continuing to talk about the three certainties, focusing on the first of these three certainties in this lesson. This is of course the certainty of intention. We'll explore what the certainty of intention entails in this lesson and we'll talk about some of the legal issues that arise from trying to establish intention for the creation of an express trust. So we outlined the view in the previous lesson from the case from 1840 of Knight and Knight that in order for a trust to be created, an express trust to be created, so we're not talking about constructive or resulting trusts in terms of implied trusts, we're talking about an express trust, there must be a certainty of intention, a certainty of subject matter, and a certainty of objects. It has to be clearly certain that the individual who is placing that property on trust intended to create a trust. It has to be very certain uh, and clearly uh, definable and delineatable what that property actually is and we have to be very clear in and defining the ability to understand essentially who the beneficiaries are so uh, who is and who isn't a beneficiary those are the three certainties so what does the certainty of intention tell us therefore well it just tells us that in order for an individual to create a trust it must be very clear that they have the intention to do so that they have clearly intended to do um, the creation of a trust and not say some other kind of legal relationship the case of night and night as we remember from the previous lesson illustrated this example quite nicely because it was held to be the case that the will was an absolute gift rather than a trust owing to a lack of in, of certainty in terms of intention, subject matter, and objects. And so this is why this uh, the certainty of intention is so important in the formation of a trust. But it should also be noted that the test for showing uh, the certainty of intention uh, is relatively vague. And the reason for this is there is no one single de definitive method by which we can show and prove the certainty of intention. There's no clear objective test that we can just rely on that is established in some case or some statute for determining what the certainty of intention is, determining whether or not there is a certainty of intention. And so as a result of which, the courts have taken various different approaches on various accounts of how to show a certainty of intention in any given scenario. Now, the first thing to note when we think about this certainty of intention is we have to also think about the equitable maxim, which states that equity will look to substance rather than form. What does this mean? In the context of the conversation that we're having, what this essentially means is that determinations of a trust and whether or not there was an intention to create a trust may depend on the actions of a settler rather than the specific words cited in this alleged trust instrument. So you have to go further than just reading the document itself, which is alleged to have been a trust, because the words may say one thing, but if everything else to the contrary says another thing uh, then owing to the fact that equity looks at substance rather than just at form it therefore means that we have to think about whether or not a, a, a trust was actually created owing to the actions of the settler or the testator rather than the specific words cited now there are plenty of cases that illustrate this particular principle and i've gone for a very recent case from 2020 uh, of the uh, of the high commissioner for pakistan and the reason why is because a this is a complicated case and b this is a case which is quite interesting in terms of establishing a certainty of intention so ultimately this this case dates all the way back to the partition of india in the 1940s i believe when the transfer of money by the uh, at the time um, nazam of 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 haider abadad which i am not very good at the pronunciations before anybody comes at me in the comments um essentially they transferred money to the high commissioner of pakistan in the united kingdom the monetary value of this fund had grown from the original £1 million all the way back in the 1940s to a staggering £35 million in today's revenue. Now, the family of the Nizam had sought over the years to recover this money and they launched a number of proceedings uh, proceedings sorry at a number of different times uh, a new round of proceedings was to, uh, was to take place um, in 2013 by pakistan specifically 
Now, in to, the 2013 proceedings came against NatWest. NatWest were the original repositories for the money. So the original um, bank in which the, the money was first deposited was NatWest. And so the first of the proceedings in 2013 came by Pakistan to um, the to, to NatWest as they were the original um, repository. Now, the issues in this case was the question for the court, essentially, was whether or not Pakistan had some beneficial interest or was a trustee in terms of the, the, the money, the High Commissioner for Pakistan. And it was held that no express trust would arise since the original transfer of the property was done by an agent of the Nizam who did not have the authority to create a trust. And so in doing so, this case does a number of things. Firstly, it gives us an indication as to the determination of the certainty of intention. This is in the case where we have the allegation of a trust being created by a third party. This third party in question was, of course, the agent of the Nizam. Secondly, it gives us some insight into the language used in the process of creating a trust and that the impact of this language, the impact of this language has essentially the use of the term trust is by no means conclusive as to the existence of an express trust. It is one of the factors that must be taken into account when considering whether or not a trust has been created. So that's quite interesting. And this adheres to the principle of equity seeking substance rather than form or acting on substance rather than form. Because what it says here is that just because it says trust, that doesn't mean anything. Because in this case, the authority to create a trust had not been granted to the agent of the Nizam. And so as a result of which, the fact that there was the word trust utilized in the creation of this instrument is meaningless, given the fact that there are other factors that must be taken into account. And this gives rise to one of the biggest issues when it comes to the certainty of intention. And this refers to the kind of language that is used in the creation of a trust. Now, we highlight and we uh, single out this idea of precatory language for a number of reasons. Because in determining the certainty of intention, how much weight should be given to certain words and the use of different types of language? Now, this is where we get to this idea of precatory language or precatory words. A precatory word or a, a precatory expression, should I say, is a, a set of words, expression, sentence, phrase, which expresses some kind of hope or desire. So, for example, the easiest one is, I hope that blah, 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 blah. I hope that the, the property is put on tr trust or I hope that this happens or I hope that this person becomes the benefit of this um, of this money that I've left in my will. I desire you to. I desire you to hold this property for 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 for, for my um, family, for example. In law. When we think about precatory language and we think about it in relation to the certainty of intention, the language itself, I hope that or I desire you to, is not enough in and of itself to find the determination of an express trust. You can't just go, if you had a problem question and the problem question was asking you to essentially unpack the certainty of intention and you had this, uh, you had a trust instrument in front of you and in that we use lots of different precatory pieces of language, you can't just say, well, because of the use of this language, therefore a trust exists in and of itself. In modern law, the aim is to try and find language which points to a legal obligation rather than just some kind of want or desire. This is not to suggest, though, that the use of precatory language will nullify the existence of a trust. If you have all the required prerequisites, all the intention that you could possibly need to create a trust, and you just so happen to use the phrase, I hope that, or I desire you to, that could still be enough to satisfy the certainty of intention. But the modern law wants to be more certain in trying to establish a legal relationship here, because I desire you to does not necessarily imply that you are essentially expressing the the idea of a legal obligation, which is what a trust would be, or I hope that. So language which points to a legal obligation is a lot more strong, is a lot stronger, should I say, than that of um, precatory language. Indeed, too, it should be noted that um, we're talking not about moral obligations either. We're talking about legal obligations. The trust is a legal instrument, is the creation of equity. And so as a result of which, this idea of a moral obligation is also meaningless, whether or not you're moral or not. The idea is here, we're talking about legality and legal obligations. 
So let's think about the case of Lamb and Ames from 1871. Essentially, in this case, the testator, the person who is leaving the property on trust at the, uh, the point at which he dies, um, would leave his estate to his wife. The wording of the will stated that the estate, quote, be at her disposal in any way she may think best for the benefit of herself and her family. That is the sort of key part of the will that is important for our examinations. Now, the question that the court may ask is, was there a trust? Is this property being held on trust? Therefore, was there a necessary certainty of intention? Well, the language was determined in this case to be too... Uh, to be the uh, sorry was determined to be precatory language and so it did not impose the intention necessary to create an express trust so think how strong of a uh, of a statement you have to make if this statement here is not enough to show the certainty of intention necessary to create an express trust if the phrase the the estate will be at her disposal in any way she may think best for the benefit of herself and her family that was not considered to be strong enough to create legal intention. And you can understand why, because it seems to be a passage that you would see in a will that um, doesn't necessarily impose any kind of legal obligation. The wife, sorry, the husband who has died has not suggested that the wife would be legally bound to hold this property on trust for the benefit of herself as a beneficiary and her family. This doesn't seem to make much sense. And so as a result of which, this idea of precatory language is very important. In 1948, we have a famous case here of uh, the, the Steel Wills Trusts. Uh, again, this was a case which involved the use of language, but in this case, the use of language was done by a legal professional. And what is interesting, and, and some of you might think is not particularly fair in this case, is that the legal professional in question, the solicitor, had actually used language which had been sufficient to create a trust in previous case law, but more modern case law, at least at the time, the more modern case law, actually showed that it failed to meet the standard threshold. So this legal professional essentially had not been had not done their homework in terms of um, keeping up to date with the kind of language which is necessary to show a certainty of intention. So he uses uh, or they use a, a, a piece of language that used to be sufficient, but then maybe isn't sufficient in a more modern context. The language was specifically, um, quote, I request my son, uh, my said son to do all in his power, blah, 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 etc, etc, etc. Now, this was, again, the use of precatory language, and so there was, should have been no certainty of intention, okay? Now, the reason why it was held to be the case that there was a certainty of intention was owing to the fact that the solicitor, in creating the will, had utilised language which was from previous precedent and that which the courts determined previously was sufficient to create and to find the certainty of intention. This is a relatively controversial decision, but you can understand the, uh, the, the basis and the rationale for this decision. Because essentially what the courts do here is look a little bit further than just the words that are used in the will itself. The words that are used in the will itself is, are not sufficient to create uh, the certainty of intention because uh, modern case law has come and gone and it, and it has essentially updated the standard by which we understand the certainty of intention. But the fact that the legal professional was creating a will and in doing so went and had a look at the cases maybe from their old previous uh, university notes um, to see what kind of language was sufficient for the certainty of intention and that because they were using language from a previous precedent it clearly shows that even if the language wasn't sufficient today it was clearly the intention of the legal professional to use the language which would have been the creation of a trust they were just incompetent in their job if you will in not being able to use the more up-to-date date language which would have been more sufficient for the certainty of intention so you can understand the judgment in that regard but you can still understand why it's a controversial decision because the language in and of itself would not have been sufficient for the creation of a certainty of intention